Hi, my name is Raj Mehta and I'm going to be going over a video lecture and review of electrocardiography and the basics of cardiac arrhythmias. My main references are Wikipedia, which uh, I've used for the images in this talk, uh, clinical, clinical Electrocardiography by Goldberg, and of course ECG Pocket Brain by Dr. Grauer, uh, who I'm grateful to for first teaching me about EKGs when I was a medical student. I'm going to begin this talk with the very basics. Uh, the heart contraction is uh, stimulated by an electrical circuit, a signal that travels to the heart. Now this electrical con uh, current, I'm going to call it, uh, you can see on this picture on the right as it's moving through the heart, and as the current moves through different parts of the heart, it creates uh, ventricular and atrial contraction. And this uh, current can also be measured, uh, and when we measure it, it produces the signal that we're seeing down below into this image to the left, uh, and that signal we capture is the basis for EKGs. And depending on where we capture that uh, current from different angles and different electrodes placed on the body, we'll have different EKG reads uh, from different leads. Now, uh, I'm just going to go over this from the very beginning. On the very top left here, you in your right atrium, you have your SA node, and when the signal starts from there, and we'll get started there in the se second, uh, you, what you're going to see is uh, a little bit of red spark uh, move through the atria. And so here we go, there's a signal from the SA node, and with that movement through the atria, you have this first wave here, it reaches your AV node, and then rapidly through a, con a complex uh, conduction system moves through the ventricle in a very quick uh, depolarization there and after your depolarization you're seeing now repolarization which is this last wave and that completes one circuit for a uh, uh, contraction of the heart. Now on the left here uh, each one of these waves have been labeled. The first labeled wave is a P wave uh, which is the atrial depolarization and atrial contraction. Uh, after that segment your signal goes from the SA node to the AV node and from the AV node through a uh, organized conduction system the uh, electrical current quickly passes through the entire ventricles through this complex which is known as the QRS complex which represents uh, the current for the ventricular contraction and after the ventricular contraction you have a brief pause and you have repolarization of the ventricles which happens in reverse order of depolarization and that's represented by this T wave and that PQRST represents all the waves uh, of an EKG uh, lead. Now when we record or measure uh, an uh, electrical signal in an EKG, we record it on a specific type of graph paper that is a, a standard, a defined standard. And this makes it easier for us to measure and interpret our EKGs. The way this graph paper works is that on our horizontal ox axis we're going to have time, and on our vertical axis we're going to have amplitude. Now the most important thing to note here is that this graph paper is made up of little boxes, and this is a little box, as it will represent it here, and big boxes. Now, each little box on a horizontal axis represents about 0 0.04 seconds of time. A bigger box, which makes up five smaller blocks, which is represented here, takes up about 0 0.2 seconds. The reason this is important is that when we are looking at our EKGs, we often want to tell the length of time it takes for a certain wave to occur and being able to know our boxes helps us determine the length of time that it takes for a signal to pass. The second thing that we need to know is amplitude and amplitude is just measured by the size of our box here and sometimes we count them by boxes so if you want to report um, what the amplitude is of this large signal here I might just count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 boxes from here to here. Now each box does represent one millivolt uh, um, so that's good to know, but most of the time we just report this by box numbers, which is the easier way to do it. Now let's come down here and actually take a look at what one of our standard 12 lead EKGs. Now before um, reading an EKG, it's important that you have a system. because The system will help keep you organized every time you review an EKG. The system I was taught was first determine the rate then the rhythm, then evaluate your intervals. Those are the first three important steps. 
After that, you can look at more advanced things. I look at your axis, look for signs of hypertrophy, and then look for signs of ischemia. So in this picture, if I'm going to come here and take a look at this image, first I'm going to look at my rate, and the quick hand to determine your rate is you take the number of boxes that you see and you divide that into 300. So here I see four boxes, one, two, three, four, roughly four boxes going from one electrical contraction or one beat to the next beat. And so if I do 300 divided by four, that gives me roughly a rate around 75. And if that was five boxes, it'd be about a rate of about 60. If I did 300 divided by five. And so this is slightly more than four boxes, maybe four and a half. So this rate is somewhere between 60 and 75, maybe around 70. So I know my rate, so I've done that. Next, I want to check my rhythm. Now, rhythm is a way of describing the beat-to-beat -beat variations or lack of variations. The best way to measure this is actually to take out a ruler, if you have one, or uh, a caliper, and, and look at each beat-to-beat -beat length. Now, in this particular rhythm, if I was to take a ruler and measure the first beat to the second beat, second beat to the third beat, third beat to fourth beat, and so on, I would find out that the distance or length between them was identical. And that's how I know that I have a regular rhythm. So I'm going to put regular here. If there was a lot of variation between this, if one beat to beat was shorter and the next one was longer and the next one was even longer and the one after that was even shorter, and if it wasn't the same length, then that would give me an irregular rhythm. But here we have a regular one. Now when I'm looking at my rhythm, I always take a moment to make sure that I have P waves. Because if I have P waves, that represents a sinus rhythm because the P wave means that this is in fact coming from the SA node. And so I know here I have a regular sinus rhythm. If I didn't see a P wave, I'd be worried that there was some other rhythm involved. It's also important to make sure that P wave is associated with your QRS complex and not just occurring randomly despite the rhythm of beats that you're seeing. So after I've determined my, my rhythm, the next thing I'm going to look at is my intervals. Now this is very important. Intervals begin by first identifying your PQRS complex and then looking short to make sure that they're the appropriate size and length. And for this, we're going to move up back to our larger image, which will help us evaluate interval lengths a little bit more easily. So the first thing I want to do is I want to make sure I, if I have a P wave, that my P wave is related to my QRS complex. And what I mean by that is that the P wave occurs before the QRS in every beat. Once I'm sure that they are length, the next thing I want to do is look at my PR interval. This looks at the beginning of my P wave all the way to the beginning of the QRS. Now this PR interval should be no greater than 0.2 seconds in length. And if it's greater than that, that means you have a prolonged PR interval, and that usually is a sign of some AV node dysfunction. How do I know that's a sign of AV node dysfunction? Take a look at our image here. You can see the P wave occurs, and then right here when you get to the AV node is when there's a pause before a QRS segment begins. Now if the AV node is not functioning, that area there will be longer than normal. That's how you know that represents some AV node dysfunction. Next, after looking at your PR interval, you want to look at your QRS complex, and your QRS complex, you want it to be less than 0.12 seconds. And just so you know, by the way, 0.2 seconds represents one big box or five little boxes in the graph paper we looked at below. And similarly, 0.12 seconds represents about three small boxes. So that's how roughly you can look at graph paper and find out if this is um, bigger or smaller than what your expectations is. Now, if the QRS complex is less than 0.12 seconds, that means that your uh, conduction system is working well. What do I mean by that? Well, if your electrical current went through the ventricles unaided, it would take quite long to, for that signal to move across the entire ventricles because the ventricles are actually much bigger in size than the atrium. However, the body has uh, an organized system through Purkinje fibers and the f bundle of His, and what it does is it helps sorry, it helps it rapidly shoot through the ventricles much more quickly and help depolarize the ventricles uh, in a faster method than would otherly happen, otherwise happen if there was no organized conduction system. And you can see that in this image here, as soon as you get to your AV node, you'll see it quickly goes through your organized conduction system very rapidly and then depolarizing the rest of the ventricles. Now, if this organized conduction system was not working properly, if there were any blocks in it, then what would happen is that your conduction would have to depolarize to the ventricles uh, 
uh, in a slower fashion, uh, piece by piece, the same way it depolarizes through the atrium. And therefore, because it would take longer to depolarize through the ventricles, your QRS signal would take be wider and represent a longer span of time. So if, what I'm getting back to here, is that if your QRS is greater than 0.12 seconds, it suggests that your organized conduction system is not working and there's most likely some kind of block. And that's what we call bundle branch block. That's why wide QRS complexes are associated usually with some kind of bundle branch block. Okay, very long-winded explanation. We'll move on. After looking at my QRS complex, the next thing I look at is my ST segment. The ST segment is important not because of the length that it represents, but more because of the morphology. If you have an elevated ST segment, and let's see if this ST segment went up like this, that could be signs of ischemia. Similarly, if it was depressed, if it was lower than the normal line of where your current runs, that could be another sign of ischemia. So anytime you see any ST elevation or depression, that should be something that kind of tips you off that something may be going abnormally. And finally, we have our T wave. Uh, and what we want to look at with our T wave is our QTC interval. If that's prolonged, that can be a concerning sign that um, that patient may be at risk for going into VTAC or VFib. Now, when you're looking at the T wave, the morphology of the T wave is also important because if your T wave is inverted, that could be a sign of ischemia, or if your T wave is very peaked, sorry about that, that could be a sign of some kind of hyperkalemia or other arrhythmia. So when I'm looking at my intervals, it's always good to, to take a look at the whole picture like that. Okay, good. Now that we've reviewed the interval, let's go back here to finish off our systematic method of looking at EKGs. So we've looked at intervals, and we find that all our intervals are okay. Next, we look at axis. Axes are pretty simple. I look at leads 1 and leads 2. Now, in these leads, the R wave is whenever this QRS complex is going up, and the S wave is when it's going down. Now, if the S wave is greater than the R wave, then the QRS complex is negative. If that happens in lead 1, if your S is greater than R, that's a sign of right axis deviation, RAD. However, if in lead 2 your S is greater than R, that's a sign of left axis deviation. And if in neither leads 1 or lead 2 do you see any findings of S being greater than R, that means you just have a normal axis. So in our patient, our R waves are nice and high, bigger than our S waves, so we know we have a normal axis. Straightforward enough? Next, we look for hypertrophy, and hypertrophy can usually be found by adding up the amplitude of V5 and V6 with V1 and V2. And if that is greater than 35, that's usually a sign of left ventricular hypertrophy. And in this patient, that's not the case, which is very good. And finally, you want to look for signs of ischemia. Ischemia, again, you want to look at your ST segments. If your ST segments are strongly elevated or depressed, that can be a sign of ischemia. So if, if this was very elevated like this, I'd be a little bit worried. Conversely, if you see T-wave inversions, like you're seeing here, if you see T-wave inversions, that can be a sign of ischemia. Now, it's worth pointing out that there is a backward Z here. This is your backward Z. If you have a T-wave inversion in this backward Z that stretches from leads 3 through AVF, AVL, AVR, and lead V1, it's normal to find T-wave inversions there. So that's not really a sign of ischemia. But if you see T-wave inversions anywhere else, that can be abnormal. So in this patient, um, there's no real significant signs of T-wave inversions. This is this looks pretty normal. I don't see any signs of ischemia. So yeah, that's my systematic method, and uh, it helps, uh, again, if I can't emphasize this importantly enough, it helps keep you organized and helps you avoid missing anything when you look at your EKGs. Now, uh, the EKG has 12 leads, thus it's called the 12 lead EKGs, and the group of uh, leads have different names to help identify their rough locations. You have your inferior leads, you have your septal leads, you have your anterior leads, and finally you have your lateral leads. Now if I'm looking at an EKG, the way I can identify them, and I have this nifty little graph here to help me, is that 2, 3, and AVF, so I'm a 2, 3, and AVF, those are my inferior leads. Next, my septal leads are pretty easy. V1 and V2 are usually my septal leads. And my anterior leads are V3 and V4. Some people include V2 in their anterior leads, but this is V3 to V4 is roughly your anterior leads. And finally, your lateral leads are V5 and V6, and they also include 1 and AVL.